This is going to be the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to Timothy. And I've already done a verse by verse on this, but it's just such a great little epistle. I wanted to go through it again and just kind of take my time on it. And let's just take our time on it and just do a straight up verse by verse, no outline. Just really looking at each verse and really getting to know Timothy. And the best thing you, one of the best things you can do with the Bible is make these Bible characters your friends. And get to know Timothy as a friend. Get to know Paul as a friend. And let's just go through the epistle of Paul the Apostle to Timothy. I'm going to start off by helping you get to know Timothy a little bit. Timothy, also known as Timotheus... He joins Paul the Apostle on his second and third missionary journeys. And Timothy most likely knew Paul better than anybody. Imagine that. Imagine being able to say that the Apostle Paul is your spiritual father in the Lord and that you know him better than everybody. He knows you better than everybody. And if you got a Bible question, need help with something he wrote in one of his epistles, one of those things that's Hard to be understood, as Peter said. You got him on speed dial. You got him on favorites on your on your phone. And you can just dial him right up. And he's going to send you a text message right away. Imagine that. Imagine having that luxury. He probably knew Paul better than anybody. And Timothy is a missionary and pastor. And I'm going to have you turn to some verses and just give you time to turn to them. So if you've got your Bible... Turn to 2 Timothy 4.22. And I'm just, I'm going to give you, I'm going to turn to them. Usually I've got them wrote out. That way I don't have to turn to them and I can just go through these really fast. We're going to take it slow and I want you to turn to them as well. So 2 Timothy 4.22 says, The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. The second epistle unto Timotheus ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians, was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. That's right under 2 Timothy 4.22. It says, The second epistle unto Timotheus. That's Timothy. Ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians. So, Timothy is not only a missionary, he's also a pastor. He's ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians. A bishop is a pastor. So Timothy knew Paul better than anybody. A missionary and a pastor. Now, if you look at 2 Timothy 1.5, I'm going to show you who his mother and grandmother is. Look at 2 Timothy 1.5. Paul says to Timothy, he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that's unpretended faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So Paul's saying that his mother and grandmother was full of faith, and he's persuaded that Timothy is also. And I'd say that Eunice and Lois both had a part in giving him that faith. God obviously did, and he used Lois and Eunice to put that faith in him. Grandmothers are so important. If you're a grandmother, you're so important to the faith of your child. It's, it's unbelievable. Just You talk to people, and th their parents have never told them the Bible. Their father's usually doesn't care about the Bible. Their mother is just so overwhelmed and busy and trying to make up for the father that she doesn't have time to give him the Bible a lot of times for some reason. But then their grandmother, they, they get their Bible from their grandmother. That's the way it was for me. I remember as a kid, my grandmother just constantly putting the Word of God in my heart. Grandmothers are so important. Even if you're just reading them the Bible. Even if you're just reading them little Bible storybooks, you're still directing them towards the Bible. And mothers are so important. Who's with the kid more than anybody? 
the mother usually. And it's the way it was for Timothy. His, his father was a Greek, and it doesn't say his name, but we know his mother and his grandmother's name, and most likely they contributed a lot to bringing him up to be the Apostle Paul's sidekick in the faith. So, son of Eunice, son of Lois, his grandmother, his father's a Greek. It talks about in Acts 16.1. His father's a Greek. Maybe he wasn't saved. But we know his grandmother and mother was. And another cool fact, Timothy is the only one that Paul calls man of God. Imagine that. Imagine that, having that credibility. Out of everybody, you're the only one that the Apostle Paul himself calls man of God. In 1 Timothy 6, 11. And let me show you something else about Timothy. Look at Philippians 2. Look at Philippians 2, 19. I'm going to show you how, how another thing that Paul feels towards Timothy. Philippians 2, 14. Or no, Philippians 2, 19. He says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. So, Paul has confidence in Timothy that he's going to go to the Philippians and that he's going to give the right report back to him about their state. He's got confidence in him. He says, but I trust to send, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. He says, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state except for Timothy. He says, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ, but not Timothy. Timothy is like Paul. He puts others first. He's like the Lord Jesus. He puts others first. He doesn't please himself first. He doesn't love himself first as the world consistently tells you to do. He's like-minded with Paul. Paul said, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Obviously, except for Timotheus, who he's going to shortly send to him. So Paul has a lot of confidence in Timothy. And something else about Timothy. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3.6. It's just really good to turn in your Bible, get used to turning the pages in your Bible. <clears throat> That's why I thought it would be good that we'll just do it like this and go through it really slow and give maybe people that's, that's new to the Bible, give them a chance to get familiar with it. This will be 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. So 1 Timothy 3, 6, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Look at that. Timothy gives credit where credit is due. He said, When Timotheus came from you and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity. And that you have good remembrance of us always. Timothy wasn't one of these people that was just going around and all he could do is find negative in people. No, he was going around and giving credit where credit was due. And the Apostle Paul's like that. He didn't take glory in the fact that somebody's living in sin. He didn't take glory in the fact that someone was called in sin like the guy was in 1 Corinthians 5. You know, he was he wanted the people to do well. He wanted to hear about their success. Or like the Apostle John, his epistles, it, it just made him full of joy to find out that the people he led to the Lord or was close with was prosperous and in good health. 
You know, it ain't like people are today where, you know, you're on the deathbed and they're over there happy about it a lot of times. That's the way a lot of Christians are today. Uh, Timothy wasn't like that. He gives credit where credit's due. And you know what? Paul calls him a brother, a minister of God, and fellow laborer in 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. Paul calls him a servant of Jesus Christ in Philippians 1, 1. Or that might be Philemon, chapter 1 and verse 1. Make sure. I abbreviate the names of the books. <clears throat> yeah, it's Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. So he calls Timothy a brother in Philemon 1 1. He considers him a brother. Not only is he his spiritual son, he's also his brother. Well, it's the same in Philippians 1 1 as well. So it is Philippians 1 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So he calls he calls him a servant of Jesus Christ in Philippians 1 1. He calls him a brother in Philemon. Verse 1, and just, you see compliment after compliment from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, over and over. He's got nothing but good to say about him. And that's the way it ought to be. People, you know, even though we're not perfect, we ought to be blameless, and people shouldn't have one evil thing to say about you. And let, if they do, let it be a falsely, let it be a false accusation. So Paul calls him a brother. He calls him a minister of God and fellow laborer. He calls him a servant of Jesus Christ in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. He is a work fellow. He calls him that in Romans 16.21. Paul calls him a beloved son and faithful in the Lord in 1 Corinthians 4.17. And you could just keep going on and on with it. All these compliments that that Paul gives to Timothy. So, let's do a little breakdown of Timothy real quick. Let's look at our three applications for Timothy. Historically, what you have with this epistle to Timothy is Paul writes to Timothy and gives instructions to Timothy on how to pastor. He's a young pastor. Paul is an aged guy. And he's, he's got a lot of wisdom that Timothy doesn't have. And he's given him instructions on how to pastor. Historically, that's what you've got. What about doctrinally? Doctrinally, what you have with First Timothy is the proper order of local churches. Inspirationally, what do you have? Inspirationally, you got how to conduct ourselves and be an example in the church. It's like, inspirationally, it's like a handbook for church order that me and you can refer back to. You want to know how the church, a local church ought to go, you need to look at 1 Timothy. And see, in the Bible, you don't just have the church, which is his body, the Lord Jesus Christ's body. You see, every born-again believer makes up the body of Christ, which is the church, right? Every born-again believer that ever lived, no matter where they go to church, if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then they're saved, they're in the body of Christ. That is the church. But you also have local churches scattered around everywhere. And 1 Timothy is the handbook for local churches. All right, now I'm going to give you the breakdown here. Chapter 1, you got how to deal with heresy. Chapter 2 and 3, how to regulate church life. Chapters 4 through 6, how to conduct our daily living. Okay, now I'm going to show you how Jesus Christ is seen in Timothy. You got Christ seen as the only potentate. That's chapter 6 and verse 15. 
and you see him as God manifested in the flesh. Chapter 3 and verse 16. Okay, what's the setting? The setting is Paul had sent Timothy to Ephesus to counter false teaching, and he wants to come see Timothy, but he writes this letter in the meantime. That's the setting. And here's, a more, here's some more little facts about this little epistle. Timothy was a man called by God to pastor a local church set up by the Apostle Paul. So Timothy is a pastoral epistle. It falls under the category of a pastoral epistle. And in this epistle, Paul will give Timothy guidance on how to pastor. In chapter 1, how to pastor older people as a young man. Timothy is a young man. And you see that in chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. So go ahead and turn over to chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. And look at verse 12 through 13. He tells Timothy, he says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, by the laying on the hands of the presbytery. So he's telling Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. He is a young pastor, and he's got a lot of older people. Now look at chapter 5 and verse 1. He tells him to rebuke not an elder. That's a wise thing to tell a young pastor. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. So he's trying to guide Timothy on as a... Uh, Timothy's a young man. He wants to guide him on how to pastor older men. Now, you look at chapter... Or no, you just look at another thing in chapter 1. In chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul is pleading with Timothy to stay in Ephesus. You know, maybe... He, you know, he says, I, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. Maybe he was a little bit discouraged. He wants him to stay there. In chapter 4, 11 through 16, Paul encourages him not to neglect his own study time. Maybe as a young man, he was busy running around all the time. More for the work part of the ministry than the actual sitting down, studying, and doing that type of work. Laboring in the word and doctrine type of work. Maybe he was a type running around, you know, just giving out the gospel all the time, not taking enough time to study to show himself approved. So Paul encourages him not to neglect his own study time. And this is good advice for any pastor. Uh, the next thing, the next piece of advice he gives is don't be too quick to put men in leadership. And that's chapter 5, 17 through 22. The next thing he tells him, bodily exercise profiteth little. Maybe Timothy was a, a gym rat, and he was having to tell him, you know, bodily exercise, it profits a little bit. It's keeping you in good shape, but you'd be better off just to exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And that's chapter 4 and verse 8, chapter 5, verse 23. This is a big one, an offensive one. One of the more offensive things that I believe, just because I believe the Bible, but I notice any time I say this, people really give me a look of anger. He wants Paul wants Timothy to enforce the no women in authority rule. That's chapter 2, 11 through 15, which is where you can read about that. The next thing, stand against false teachers. And that's chapter 1, 6 through 7. He talks about from which some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. You see, he's he got all these people that swerved and they're trying to teach stuff which they ought not. 
and verse 19 through 20 in chapter 1 says, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So you got these guys like Hymenaeus and Alexander, these false teachers that Paul wants Timothy to stand against. So he's giving him a lot of instructions on what he needs to do. Now, Timothy, the first epistle of Paul, the apostle to Timothy, it's not short compared to Paul's epistles as a whole, but it's not big either. You know, Romans has 16 chapters. 1 Corinthians has 16 chapters. The epistle to Timothy here, the first one, has six chapters, 113 verses, and around 2,244 words. Obviously, the author is Paul. The time span is around 63 to 65 A.D. It's written in Rome or Macedonia. So that's a quick little intro to Timothy there. So let's look at a couple verses. Okay, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle. An apostle is one who is sent. Apostle is one who is sent, like a postal, like a postal service. One who is sent. And a, an apostle, you me show you, I'm going to show you what, it, what you had to be to be an apostle. I'm going to show you what it took. Look at Acts chapter 1 and, and verse 22. Turn way over to Acts 1, 22. You know, a lot of people claim to be apostles today, but there is no apostles today. They claim they got all these apostolic signs like the apostles had it. They, they claim they can heal people, speak in tongues, pick up snakes, get bit by them, not be hurt and all that. But actually, there's no apostle today. But look at Acts 122. And this shows you what it what you had to have to be an apostle. It says in Acts 122, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. So to be an apostle, you had to be a witness of the resurrected Lord Jesus. It says beginning from John from the baptism of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And that's not none of these people today, none of these people today that claim to be apostles qualify for that. They did not see the resurrected Lord Jesus. And you know, Paul said, last of all, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. So Paul is an apostle. He's not one of the 12, but he's an apostle. And he had the apostolic signs as well. You know, in Acts 28, he had that venomous snake grab a hold of his hand and he just shook it off and threw it into the fire and it didn't even hurt him. You know, he could send... Um, he could send handkerchiefs out and just him sending his handkerchief to somebody, them grabbing it, touching it, it could heal them. And he, uh, Paul said, I speak with tongues more than ye all. If Paul had the apostolic signs. You don't. I don't. I don't desire to have them. I just desire to have what God wants me to have. And the apostolic signs is not for me. First off, 1 Corinthians one twenty two says the Jews require a sign. And in Mark 16, it tells you that all that stuff were signs. You know, they, the apostles went everywhere preaching the word and confirming the word with signs following, as it says in Mark 16. That stuff was to confirm the word with signs following. And it's the Jews that require a sign, not Gentiles and God's dealing with the Gentiles primarily today. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an apostle is one who is sent. 
And an apostle had to be a witness of the resurrect, resurrected Savior. That's Acts one twenty two. Paul was one. 1 Corinthians 15.8, it shows you that. Uh, he says, last of all, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. By the commandment of God our Savior. Notice that. It calls God our Savior. Well, what does that prove to you? Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. He's God. That's a deity of Christ first right there. That shows you that Jesus Christ is not just the Son of God. He is God. He's God manifested in the flesh. There is a lot of talk against that today. The fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. By the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. And that's a purifying hope. If Jesus Christ is your hope, it's a purifying hope. If you're looking for the rapture, if you're looking at, for Jesus Christ to meet you in the air, and any moment now that the Lord Jesus Christ, you, He's just going to come in the clouds, and he's going to take you out. That's a purifying hope. You know, John talks about in 1 John 3, 3. He talks about, you know, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. So it's not like, oh, we're just living however we want to live because God's just about to take us out for the tribulation. No, it's like Jesus could appear at any moment. And when he comes to get me in the clouds, in the air... I want to be doing some, I want to be doing this right now. Like I want the rapture to happen right now while I'm doing this. So <clears throat> we're not just looking for an easy way out, but we have a purifying hope. The Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Jesus is my hope of, of glory. He, he lives in me. He's in me right now. He's in me right now while I'm, t I'm teaching you this. And that's something that the Old Testament saints didn't have. You know, they did not have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God living in them at all times, no matter what. But me and you have that. In Colossians 1.27, it talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's, it's a sure thing. He is a permanent resident inside me at all times, no matter what. No matter what happens, He lives in me. No matter what you've done, He lives in you. And nothing can take that away from you. It wasn't like that in the Old Testament. You know, you have a privilege that those Old Testament Bible heroes did not have. You know, Samson back there, he had the Holy Spirit and then lost it and then got it back. Then you got a guy like King Saul who had the Holy Spirit. He lost it and never got it back. And then you had even a man like David, a man after God's own heart, after he sinned, he said, take not the Holy Spirit from me, back there in Psalm 51. Me and you do not ever have to pray that. We got Christ in us, the hope of glory. The Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. He's God, our Savior. So Paul, an apostle to Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'm going to go ahead and stop it right there. We only made it to, through the introduction in the first verse. But I'm just going to take my time on it and just get this, get this down in, in your Bible. Take notes on it. Get this stuff in there. And here's just a little quick overview of chapter 1 of Timothy. You got Jesus Christ seen as the one who came to save sinners. And verse 15. So look at verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The main thought is teach doctrine. Teach doc Paul wants Timothy to teach doctrine above stories more about doctrine than on stories you know fables teach doctrine above experiences so this shows you that 
you know, a young guy like Timothy, probably not got very many experiences, but he's got doctrine. He's got a lot of doctrine. Uh, teach doctrine above things that minister questions. You know, things like endless genealogies. Physical or spiritual genealogies. You know, because in 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and 1 Corinthians 3, 4, what were the Corinthians' arguments about? Who was their spiritual father? Was it Paul? Was it Apollos? Was it the Lord Jesus? Was it, uh, was it Cephas? Which is Peter, you know. Don't get into all this endless genealogy stuff. It just ministers questions. It just brings divisions many times. But doctrine is key. And I mean, doctrine will bring division too, but it's the right kind of division. So that's the main thought for chapter 1. We only made it to the first verse, but we'll get more into it later.